Welcome everyone. I'm Lucy Castaldo. I'm the executive director of IS183 Art School, and I'd like to welcome you to this virtual artist talk with Paula Shallon. IS183 is a nonprofit community art school based in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and our mission is to provide hands-on experiences in the visual arts for all ages, all incomes, and all skill levels. We offer studio-based programs in multiple disciplines year-round, and now we've ventured into online programming. You can find our virtual classes and some in-person opportunities locally and learn more about us on our website at is183.org. And we strive to support local artists. So we do that through access to exhibition opportunities, residencies, and equipment. And the goal of this Artist Talk series is to highlight the wealth of talent in our region and provide a paid opportunity for an artist to gain exposure. Paula is a Berkshire-based ceramic artist and faculty artist at IS-183. She is the second in three generations of potters. She exhibits nationally at galleries and retail shows, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art Craft Show and the Smithsonian Craft Show. She recently received a national award for sustainability at the Smithsonian Craft Show. And she's participated as an artist in, resident at, in residence at both Arcadia National Park and the Dune Shacks on the Outer Cape. And that's something that inspired her current work. Um, and something that I love that she states in her bio on our website is that her work is a quiet tribute to the details found in nature. So thank you all so much for joining tonight. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Paula. Thank you, Lucy, and welcome everybody. There's a big crowd and I can only see a few of you, but um, when we get to the end and you're asking questions, if you can identify yourself, that would be lovely so I know who's speaking. Um, okay, I'm gonna dive right in. So most of my work has been focused on the vessel form and it's only in the last year or so that I've transitioned to doing my sculptural seed pods. And I'm just gonna explain the story of sort of how I made that transition. But before I begin that piece, I wanted to let people know who aren't familiar with my work that all of my work is hand built. I don't use a potter's wheel. And so I tend to use all three of the basic hand building techniques. And I thought I'd just quickly introduce people who aren't familiar with clay to those techniques um, and show you the kind of results of those. So I'm going to pick up my computer and hopefully not make you guys dizzy by moving slowly. Um, and I'll just bring you over to this part of my studio. Uh, so the um, one of the most early forms of forming things out of clay is to take a lump of clay and pinch pieces of clay between your thumb and your fingers and create pots that way. Um, and so this is a basic pinch pot right here. Um, get the light better. And it's uh, been smoothed and refined. Obviously my pinch marks aren't left in that, um, but it, you can leave the marks in there and they can be really beautiful as well. And that's a way to form small, round or irregular objects. Here's another little pinched form. Uh, and then this is a tiny little pinched form with the addition of a slab, um, get the light on there better, a slab attachment to it. So a slab, working with slabs is just like rolling out pizza dough and uh, doing what you want with that slab texture wise. And then I attach that to the small pinch pot. Um, some other examples of slab work, sorry to swing you around like that, um, is those boxes that you see right here and what well, you can't really see right here and here. Those are created, the texture is made when the slab is flat on the table and then it's stood up and formed into a cylinder and uh, this one has a, obviously a top on it that I've created a box form out of. This little house form was also made out of um, a slab as well. And you can see I leave the seams often in my slab work. Uh, and this piece right here is coiled. So I start with a pinched base and then I add snakes of clay 
to coil and make this a larger, larger piece. And then the slab is added on, on top. And the same with, same with this piece, coil and slab. And then there's a, a big one that hasn't been smoke fired yet. It's white and that's a big coil bowl that will turn black and gray in the smoke firing. Um, so that leads me to the firing process. And this way you'll have a basic understanding of, uh, of the techniques that I use. So I don't use glaze. Most potters will, will glaze their work. Um, and it's a glass formation over the clay that makes it impervious to water, etc. cetera. Um, I only use clay. And, and uh, so when you see a shiny area on my piece, that's actually polished clay that's been burnished. Um, you might be familiar with some Native American burnished work. Uh, and it is burnished and fired in an electric kiln. And it's actually a white like this when the, when the clay is fired. And all the black and gray that you see comes from smoke or carbon entering the clay. And, I, and so I've just spent many years playing with that very basic um, concept and process of, of a combustible, mine is sawdust, um, that burns and the carbon absorbs into that clay surface when the atmosphere is starved of oxygen. Uh, and I, I love the softness of clay and the quality of the clay and I'd rather not cover it in a glaze. Glazes are beautiful and can be gorgeous, but for my work I prefer that simplicity and the, um, the softness of it. So that's a little on the, the how, I, how I process my work. And so I've moved to the smoke fire seeds and obviously I'm still using all my same techniques, but I've changed the form and the focus. And I wanted to talk about how I came to that. Um, so I've been doing the craft show circuit for I think about 10 years now. And it's a great way to share your work with people and um, sell your pots. But it is a, a little bit of a um, catch 22 for me because when I am doing lots of shows, I, I get on a gerbil wheel of having to produce enough work to uh, merit the really high booth fees that I pay, you're paying over $1,000 to have a small booth and you need to sell work in order to make that valuable and worthwhile. And so I would uh, apply to shows and end up um, applying as much as a year ahead for some shows and you don't know what you're gonna get into. So I sometimes would get overwhelmed and just have to crank out work. Now my work is slow, the process is slow and I'm never really cranking out multiples, but I did need to uh, focus my attention on how I could produce enough work that was still authentic to me in the process, but uh, I would have enough for the shows. And so I, I felt a little trapped by that and, and uh, was really wishing for a time period where I could develop my work in a different direction. And a, a couple of years ago, I think it was about two years ago, I was at, I think, the Philly Museum Show or ACC Baltimore, and uh, Carla Massoni, who is a gallery owner, she has a craft gallery and a fine art gallery, and she's collected my work for years. She was stopping by my book as usual, and she um, asked how I was doing, and I, and I felt that burnt out feeling, and I sort of relayed that to her. And she, she had a lot of empathy for me and I think she bought a piece and then off she went. And then the next day she came back and she said, how would you like to be part of a group show about trees? And I said, that sounds great. And, I, and so what that did is it gave me permission to, and focus to exp uh, change my direction. And, Little did she know for the three or four months previous to our interaction, I had been sketching a lot in my sketchbook um, about the Berkshire County trees and how um, materials would collect in their crevices and how leaves were joining to branches and everything, everything of interest in the um, world of trees. And so I had already started this endeavor and it was a perfect sort of um, meeting of, of um, her show and my interest. 
And so I'm going to um, go ahead and share my screen for a minute and flip through some slides or you can, I'm dating myself right now, whatever you call them, um, images. <laughs> and uh, and uh, not linger long on them because I want to do some actual live demonstration as well. But um, this will help sort of explain my process and how I came to the seed pods. So let me do that. Um, and I'm assuming everyone can see the shared screen at this point. Okay. Um, so the, this is obviously a pot, a coiled vessel. And this is an example of the smoke firing process that it's a contemporary process based on very ancient traditional firing where you're putting your pot into combustibles and for me it's wood shavings from a fine furniture maker who I use his scraps as my fuel uh, and when you do this process in the in a in a um, common way that sawdust firings are done inevitably some oxygen gets into the kiln even though you've shut the kiln down and uh, and this uh, smoke is created but the the piece always has a lively surface for the most part and that works really well on a simple form but i uh as time went on so these are some pieces with the the traditional smoke fire process um oh that's we'll go back um it, that is beautiful i think in a in its own way but as i became more interested in the subtleties of my textures and some more graphic work I was doing. I didn't want the interruption of, of the smoky dramatic surface. So I was trying to find a way to create a more even smoke process. And I, I ultimately came to um, wrapping my pieces like a baked potato. I wrapped them in newspaper and then I wrapped them in foil. Um, and I'll show you, hold on. Um, they end up looking, they end up looking like this. It's just basically there's news, there's a pot in there, there's newspaper wrapped around it, and then a very well sealed foil sagger. Um, and it contains the pot and the combustible right up against it. And what it does is it does not allow any oxygen in there. And so uh, when it's firing, I just need to bring the kiln up to the temperature that paper burns at, 451 degrees or a little bit higher and it will spontaneously combust in there without any added oxygen. And, and in that way, I, I get a very even firing. And you can see um, that I, can you see me too or just the screen? Me too, okay. So you can, you can see that um, you get a more even black and not that smoky surface. Um, okay, let me go this way. So there is an example of, um, of my desire to be more graphic and use the smoke in a more controlled way. And so then I started experimenting with how smoke reacts to different clay surfaces. So you'll see um, in this series that is uh, inspired by the sort of silhouette of barns in Berkshire County and the, the moon. Um, in this, the first tile on the left hand side is that it, the, the ground there is a polished fine clay slip and that takes the smoke most readily. The medium gray is just my bare clay and it, which is white when it's bisque fired but then goes to that soft gray in the smoke. And then the off white is a commercial underglaze um, which is basically a colored slip um, and it has some materials in it that resist the smoke. Um, so that is uh, the way I was able to get more control over my, my firing process. Um, okay, so uh, here's a couple pieces where you can see the, the importance of having that. If this was really dynamically smoked, um, like the first pieces, I think you would lose the, um, the sort of graphic design and the, the um, quietness of the piece because there's already so much going on. Um, so, uh, and then I added color and part of the reason I add color to be very mm -hmm. frank about it is that at the craft shows, uh, it, it, is, it is, as you can imagine, quite hard to um, make a good profit. And so 
my work was basically too quiet and there was there were you know only a very small number of people would come in for that quiet work as soon as i added color my sales like tripled um and and i love color so it's not that i don't love color but uh, it wasn't it wasn't the aesthetic i was going for in the in my first my first go round but um but anyhow i have a lot of fun with color and um that's Whoops, I'm pressing the wrong button and that's that. Okay, so I'm gonna back up in the story for a minute and I and go to my uh, residency at Acadia National Park, which Lucy mentioned. And that was an essential uh, piece to ultimately coming to the seed pod forms is I spent three weeks uh, with um, nothing but the woods and I, I lived right in Scudic Point, uh, right in the park. And I spent every day hiking and photographing and sketching. Um, and and uh, being inspired by the woods. And I started making these tall pieces. Um, some of them I actually were, I was pressing the clay right into the bark and then doing additional uh, texture on top of that. Um, and this is where the beginning of sort of these tall forms that were tree-like uh, started. And, I, and uh, this um, piece on the far left, you can kind of see where the texture from the actual tree bark is. And then I added perforations because I fell in love with all the perforated bark. Um, and I'll just quickly go through this though. There were some other inspirations in the forest besides trees. Uh, and I'm just gonna flip right through all this because this was an, many years ago. Okay, so then I get to the um, point where I'm offered this show about to do anything I want around trees. And I really have a hard time figuring out what it is I want to do with trees because I love so many aspects. And my first thought was that I wanted to get big, bigger and, and um, really recreate and interpret the, the tree bark and the tree itself. And I was reading um, The Hidden Life of Trees, which is a beautiful book about forests and tree life. And, um, so that was inspiring my, my attempt to recreate the tree. Um, and then I realized that it wasn't really what I wanted to do. I love the surface and working on the surface, but the form was not in really the place I wanted to be focusing my attention. So I realized that what I love so much about making vessels is the is volume and I and that sort of very full volume um, that you can get with a coil pot or a pinch pot and so it was that point where I realized all over my studio I have hundreds of seed pods um, that I've collected through the years my kids my sister I think you're here Andrea um, and um, was um, have given me these all so many pods and I've collected so many pods um, there's a, a a tiny smattering of things that I've gathered. I'm gonna walk over here and, oh, you know what? Let me get out of this screen share for a sec. Um, hold on one sec. I gotta escape. Okay. Um, oh wait, stop sharing. There we go, okay. Um, so, um, all right, so, Here's a whole collection there. Um, and then it goes down and on and on and I have bags and boxes full and, and then my house is 10 times more full than my studio with all sorts of collected seed pods. Um, so what I loved is the volume um, of in the shapes of these pods and all the texture. So it had all the ingredients that I love uh, and that became my focus and that's where I that's where I really honed in and said okay this show's coming up I've got to start making work that's going to be in the show and I started making um just sketching and looking and photographing and then making little tiny maquettes um and then I put all that away so I the way I work is I tend to um, gather lots of information and then put it aside and, and, and I don't really look a lot at, at, at all that information, but instead I just start to work and then I can pay more attention um, to 
the conversation between me and the material, between the clay and myself. And, and I, all, the, all that is percolating inside, but I'm not thinking about it in a linear way. I'm not thinking I wanna make this form to look exactly like this acorn. Um, but it's all been sitting in my in me and now I just um, create things. So none of the pods are directly related None of the ceramic pods are directly related to the actual pods. They are definitely inspired by them. Um, so I'm just gonna look at the time for a sec. Okay, um, so I'm going to do a couple of demonstrations um, on some of the ways that I work with the seed pods and, I, and then I'll, I'll show you some of the pods a little, a little more um, closely and then we'll have questions. So one of my favorite things is, I'm gonna aim this down onto my workspace. One of my favorite things to do, oh, the turntable is going on its own. Um, stop. There, okay. Um, is, um, is to work with um, foam and, and stretching the clay. So let me just show you what I might do for a seed pod. Um, so I will take something round, this is a pastry, cutter and use it as my guide and I might just draw very lightly circle circle which gives me a nice three-tiered shape and then I'll just go ahead and cut that out And then I would trace this and make a second one um, that will then be joined together. And many seed pods are two even sides that um, are, have a, are joined together with an area that is like a seam. So it, it works well for um, translating that with clay. I'll just do this one piece though so we don't take up too much of the time. I use my little sponge and get some water and just smooth down those edges. Now where the lines from the pastry cutter were, those will inevitably show up as cracks later, so I'm going to just compress those away. And then at this point, I would take the time to texture this if I wanted a, a texture on it. And it's kind of fun to watch how texture stretches. Um, so I'll go ahead and do, we'll do something on here quickly. Um, let's see, where's my, losing it. I'll do something else. So we'll take this little walnut seed. So sometimes I'll use the actual seeds and create the texture with those. So I'm gonna go ahead and just cover this with the texture of the walnut seed. Actually, that one, maybe something else. And then by putting this very flat form um, texture side down onto the foam, I'll then take this little plaster uh, nicely molded form and use it to get some form into the actual clay there just by rocking it. Into the clay and then sometimes I'll use a little ball to really thin the clay a little more and give it a little more volume. And 
and you can see that gives a nice uh, little volumed half to the seed pod. Um, I can show you a couple of variations on that. This is this is more similar to what I just did. And there's one with many little sections. And here's another weird kind of one with, I don't know what. Um, and you could cut out any shape and make any shape that way. And I, I really enjoy that. And one thing that I really find fascinating is when you do a texture and you change the form by stretching the clay, it can open up the texture in a way that reminds me of like the bark on a tree. It just, it does a really nice job at stretching that texture out. So after I form these pieces, I then join them together and I, and I, uh, then I will let them get to a leather hard state where they are the, um, the hardness of leather, where there's a little bit of flexibility, but hard, not much, and, it, and the, there's still moisture in the clay. Uh, and that's the time that I do my underglaze decorating. Um, so I'm gonna show you a little bit of that. So with clay, it's always really important to pay attention to the stage of dryness that it is at because that is the sort of single most important thing in terms of what you can do at a given time. And um, this is now at leather hard, where it's quite hard, but, uh, and it actually has no more flexibility. So it's like what I call a hard leather hard. And it's a great time to apply the underglaze. I can still um, carve through the underglaze to the clay beneath. So I will take this bright blue. So what happens is in the smoke fire, these underglazes, which are very bright and even brighter once it gets bisque to the white, you know, the white clay, the clay becomes white, although it's so dark now, this clay actually is white when it's bisque fired. Again, it's gonna be that white color when it's um, bisqued. Uh, and this is, um, just laying on the blue underglaze. I usually do three coats. And then I'll put some yellow on. And this will tone way down in the smoke firing process. So when it comes out of the first firing, the bisque firing, it will be a very bright, object and look more like a pastry than a seed pod <laughs> and um and then uh with the smoke firing it tones it back down to more of like what you're seeing right now but even further uh muted in color and so we're just gonna give it a little um and i'm purposely leaving this stripe un uncovered because I know that that will then go back to this gray color because that's the color that this, the um, finished smoke fired piece goes to is usually a, a pale to medium gray and I like to uh, expose the clay that way. So now we've got the yellow underglaze on and I at this point while it's still moist I'll take a, a a tool and scratch through. And this, these lines will also gather the um, carbon in them and be a dark gray like this after the smoke firing. So 
So it looks something like that now. And I won't do the other side, I'll jump up to here where I'm gonna put some dots. And here's a little slip trail bottle filled with some black underglaze. It's got a little needle top and then I can just go ahead and make little dots of varied sizes. I find that pretty much everything in the natural world has variation to it and I love um, that aspect aesthetically. All right, so we got a bunch of little dots on there. Um, I did the other side earlier so you can see kind of the finished design. And then when something like this is gone through all the different firing processes, uh, it'll have somewhat of a look like this. This one's a little different, but um, something like this where you can see the colors have muted down. There's a little bit of, of smoking at the end of the, near my thumb there, which I think brings a nice variation. Um, but the color still shows nice and nice and clearly. There's a little gray there too. So I like the slight variation that the smoke firing brings to the piece. Um, the other thing that I use quite a bit is the refined clay slip called terra sigillata. And that is that black shiny bit that you see. Um, and I will show you that. So for that, I have to have a very smooth surface. Sometimes I'll sand it, um, wearing a mask, of course, and using a, a vent. A vent. Um, but it, it is a, a really uh, nice way to emphasize a smooth and shiny surface. It's also a nice way to emphasize texture. Uh, it's a fine clay slip. It's almost like skim milk in its consistency. I make it from um, porcelain and ball clays and, it, and I basically let the heavy part, excuse me, the heavy particles settle to the bottom and then I siphon off the finest particles. And because those particles are so fine, when you go to polish them or burnish them, um, they, they lay flat and reflect light. Whereas if they were bigger and coarser, they would be like this under the microscope and the light would, would go into the crevices and be absorbed in. Whereas when they're so fine, I can compress them flat, the light will reflect off and give you the shine. Um, so I'm gonna show you what that's like because it's really fun to see. Um, all right, I think that's okay like that. Um, so I would just take my brush, it's very runny, and I need my glasses. Um, and then I just lay it on here. And I'm gonna do three coats of this. Very, very uh, drippy to try to get those drips from pooling. And then when I have the three coats on there, you can see it already is showing a bit of a shine. Then I let the water, the moisture um, soak in a little bit until it's at a point where there's no wetness, but there still is the moisture. And then that's when I go ahead and polish with, you could use your finger, you could use a cloth, or I use these um, vegetable bags from the, from the grocery store, and they seem to work the best for me. And it just brings up this amazing shine you can see that, that shine. And then this will um, be a bright white when it's fired, like you saw on this piece. Uh, there's the terra sigillata, and then it will go to a black. Um, so there's a similar little pod, and I have put some white underglaze with my slip trailer on top, which resists the smoke more than the Terrace gelata. And so basically I just do a lot of playing around with how smoke um, absorbs into these different clay surfaces. And when I'm using color, I'll test the colors and see how the smoke affects them because this under glaze would be a, a bright fire engine red. Um, that, uh, and so I wanna see how some of these resist the smoke more than others. So I'll play around um, with 
lots of tests in the smoke fire. And that's how I come to know what uh, will best uh, give me the surface that I'm trying to achieve. Um, so let's see, there was one other thing. Oh, I know, I wanted to show you guys. So here's a, here's a coil pot that I, um, that I created just the other day and it's got, it's pretty soft still. It's got the texture here, which is um, created from my middle son, um, gave me this for my birthday. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a, um, a, law, a tree from somewhere at, he, out in California. I don't know where he found it, but um, it's got this great texture. And that is what I used to make the texture on this piece. And then for the top of this piece, I'm going to keep it relatively smooth. However, I'm going to make some raised bumps on it. I like to make perforations a lot, but that I also found when I didn't go all the way through, you can create a very nice um, sort of uh, raised bump. I'll show you what I mean. Take this plastic off. So we'll just move that over there. So what I'll do is take, um, well, I'll use this. I, I don't know where the thing I was using is, but, um, but anyways, we'll use this. Let me face it down. And in the foam, I'll just go ahead and press in, but not all the way through until I get um, a nice raised uh, bump. And I love the way the foam leaves its own texture on these raised bumps. Let me show you. So it looks like this on that side, but on the side that's going to show, it looks like that. And you can't really see the texture that well, but um, it's got this really nice uh, texture on the bumps themselves. And that will go, that will set inside of here um, and uh, be the start to another larger pod. Um, so this big guy, let me grab him if I can. Ooh, um, sorry. <laughs> is a uh, is this texture was made from that uh, piece of tree that you that I just showed you, as well as some coral that I pressed in as well as I was building this big coil piece. And I really I like this piece because it has such a nice full full feel to it. Um, Heavy. It's hollow but heavy. Um, so, all right, now I think we just need to take about five more minutes and then get to questions. So I'm going to give you a little, little tour um, of some of the work itself. <laughs> so this um, tray right here you see with um, the, all the pods in it um, was inspired by scientists collection trays and the tray is ceramic as well. Uh, and I just love the idea of sort of order organizing in um, these different forms into sections and referring back to the idea of the scientific collections of different species. And there's a whole sort of overview of a bunch of, a bunch of different pods as well as some actual seed pods. Um, and one thing I didn't mention is how, for me, the tree exhibit was having me think a lot about um, our environment and the health of our environment or lack of. And I'll show you all of these pots while I'm talking. Um, this is just my shelving with all my, all my inventory on it which you can see more easily when you, if you go to the shop online that I just created. Um, then there's some really tall vessels. So I'm still doing vessel work um, as well as the seed work. Um, this piece right here actually is, a, it was made um, with that pattern from a, from a seed pod. So this little pod right here 
uh, it's the end of this little guy um, that I made those little flowery patterns with. Um, but anyhow, what I was saying, uh, and then we'll take questions, is that um, in doing the tree show, I was reading a lot of different books and poems and thinking about um, our environment. And uh, one thing I came across was a study done in Germany where the forests, um, two different forests were studied and one was a very biodiverse forest and the other was um, a single species forest. And the biodiverse forest uh, was able to um, survive through different diseases that might hit one species and not another. Whereas if there was an illness that came through the single species forest, it would wipe out the entire forest. And um, not only is <laughs> diversity and biodiversity important in um, this, the uh, an entire forest, but also within a species. So if you have a species that is genetically diverse, it also has that ability to some of that species can survive. Um, and so just in general, I, I am, when I'm making all my seed pods, everyone is pretty much a unique and different creation. And so I just, uh, love the idea of I could explore forever all the different possibilities with shape and surface um, and and uh, I love the connection to the natural world in terms of the importance of biodiversity. Um, so I think that that is probably where I'll stop and take questions. Paula it is such a treat to be able to not only hear about your inspiration, but actually see you creating. So thank you so much. Um, so we have two questions already in the chat, so I will read those out and then we can open up for more questions. And again, Milliger from Linda, she asked, does burnishing allow for a non-porous surface, i.e. could you use a burnished vessel for liquids, etc.?" That's a great question. So um, burnishing does compress the surface and, I, and it will make uh, a pot uh, less porous, but the, it'll make the pot will be less likely to, um, to leak, but it still can because the clay, especially in my smoke fire process or in most burnished clay, it's fired to a low temperature. And so the clay itself, the clay body itself is still open and can absorb liquid. So really um, it's not toxic, obviously it's just clay, uh, but it will ultimately absorb some moisture. So I, they're, they're better for dry, dry foods if you're gonna, um, want to eat something out of them. It would be something that's dry versus liquid. Awesome. Um, the second uh, question from earlier was from Maya and it is, does the, does, the tech, does the texture not get a bit smushed when you are pressing on the reverse side of the pod? Yes. Um, and I love the way it gets a little bit compressed by the, so when I'm pressing on the reverse side into the foam, I love the way it kind of compresses the texture. And if I'm going to be doing a lot of that, I'll make an extra deep texture. Um, so, but this piece that you saw me do, you can still very much see the texture. Um, so it's all in, in the touch and what you're, what you're um, pressing against. So there's a ton of questions coming in. So I'll, I'll read out a name. We have Marguerite. If you'd like to come off mute to ask your question, you're more than welcome to. I'll wait a second. My question. Hi. Hi. Um, really great presentation to us all. Thank you, Paula. Um, you mentioned that you smoke fire at 401 degrees. And and what do you smoke fire in? Yeah, so um, I actually 
these days I bring that temperature up to above 451 degrees because paper burns at 451 degrees. So I usually try to keep it up above that. Um, and I fire in both my outdoor kiln with wood shavings, which tends to get to about 800 to 1000 degrees depending. Um, and that's plenty hot enough to um, burn the paper. And that's what I'm looking for is just to burn the paper within the foil. And I will also fire in my electric kiln, um, but I can't recommend people doing that unless you understand the full um, risks involved because you wanna make sure that if there's any carbon monoxide being produced that it is cleared out of your studio. Um, so Do you use a sagger when you put the things inside the electric kiln? Absolutely, yep. So Do very- you your own sagger? Yes, foil. So that's your sagger and you stack them all in the kiln like that? I tumble stack them all and I, and most times there's no smoke that escapes, but occasionally I might poke an area with a, by mistake with the corner um, and smoke will escape. And so I'm, I'm never in here while I'm firing. And I've got my window. Interesting. Through. What a technique. I used to build saggers, big ceramic saggers, and then stack everything in that and then put that in the gas kiln firing. Yes. Yes, and I, you know, I don't I have done it just with individual stackings of aluminum foil pieces. Yeah, and I can do it inside or outside. You know, the, the outside technique is safer and works well too. Do you like a particular type of wood shavings? Well, I used to because um, they really influenced the tone and the, um, the way it would burn on the, when I did the smoky normal sawdust fire. But now it doesn't matter because all I need is wood that will burn and um, bring the temperature up. Okay, so it's not pine needles or blah blah, just you like wood. Yeah. Okay. Great questions, Marguerite. Um, we have uh, from Lisa, at what point in the process do you burnish the terracage? And um, Lisa, if you want to come off mute and elaborate, you're welcome to. Well, hi, Lisa. Hi. hi, I must have missed that part. Is it after you fire it completely that you are doing the burnishing? Sorry. Oh, I was doing that on the bone dry clay. So there's my clay. It's almost a bone dry and I do it before firing. That's when I put the terracid on. Nice. Very lovely. After I do it, you can apply it to bisquare, but it sometimes will flake off and not adhere as well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So many great technical questions. We have another one um, from Erin. How does an enclosed structure like a seed pod not explode in a kiln? Excellent question, because if you forget to put a little tiny hole in it, it will explode, and I have done that. Um, and it can ruin your whole kiln load. Um, but I, I always put a tiny little hole, so I have no idea where the hole is in here but there is a hole. I put, I use a little, all I do is one little tiny needle um, and that's all you need for the steam to have somewhere to escape. Steam can get out of a tiny hole. And so uh, that's all that's needed, but it is needed. <laughs> um, from Michelle, in a smoke firing process, do you barrel fire with wood or use an electric kiln or another type of kiln with your stackers? Right. So I think I answered that, but I, I sometimes use my electric kiln and I sometimes use my regular sawdust kiln, which is literally a bricks built up um, to whatever size I need, throw hardwood shavings in, put my foil set, sagger covered pieces in um, and, and light it. Um, those are the two methods. I, if I had a gas kiln or a rapid kiln or something, I could use that as well. It doesn't really matter. This. Can I just add to that question? Do you, how do you measure the temperature of your outdoor kiln? Do you have a pyrometer? I have a pyrometer, but I, I don't measure it anymore. I just do it and it works out. Great. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Miranda, who is Nancy Magnuson's granddaughter. Um, hey. What was hey. your inspiration for your vessels? The inspiration for the vessels. Um, so I just love the vessel form. Um, and, and it's because I, I feel like especially big round ones are like, I don't know, they're like a hug or something. And I, and 
they are so appealing and pleasing to me. And I think one of the things I love about vessels is um, the inside outside. And that's something I miss with my pods. I'm going to start doing interiors of pods instead of open pods versus closed because I love inside outside. Um, and as you'll notice, I definitely do a lot of, um, let's see, uh, interior, interior decoration on my vessels. So many, many of my vessels are just simple on the outside and then the inside um, has the interest or the more dynamic piece to it. Um, so as far as inspiration for those vessels, they, it comes from all over the place. Um, I've looked at, at, at millions of um, ancient pottery and contemporary pottery. And even before I was doing the seed pods, the forms of, of pods or trees might influence the vessel shape. So the, all those tall cylinder pieces, they began with my um, residency in Acadia and my interest in the um, tall tree trunk. So those pieces all grew from, they're all vessels and they all grew from my interest in the, the tree trunk. Thank you, Paula. You're welcome. Nice to see you, Nancy. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Um, and from Shirley, what clay body do you use? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I mostly, I started out using Mass White, which is from Sheffield Pottery. It's a low fire earthenware white clay. It's super fine and smooth and is somewhat like working with porcelain and it's um, lack of um, structure. It's, all, it's, it, it's a strange clay to work with, but it is uh, so smooth and it would give me the nice pale gray color that I'm after. So I'm going to show you something over here. I don't know if you can see with the light, uh, not so well, but um, sort of. Um, so this right here is mass white and it's a pale, it gives a pale gray tone. But sometimes, and same with this, sh this ceramic shelf is the mass white. It's nice and smooth and pale gray. Whereas sometimes I'll use, this is another um, dark stoneware body um, that gives almost a purple, like you can't see in the light, but um, a purple-like color to it with this little grog pieces showing on it. Um, so depending on the look, I'll use different clays. High fire clays will um, be more open to the smoke and so they'll get a lot darker. So um, for instance, let's see, uh, when I'm doing this kind of strong graphic work, um, I'll show you in a second, let me put the computer down. Um, I use the high fire clay so that when I scratch through the underglaze, um, you can really see the, the design. The clay body gets almost as black as the terrace gelata, whereas my low fire white clay just remains this pale gray. So depending on what I want, I use different clays. And I get all my clay at Sheffield Pottery. It's our local, we have, we're lucky, half an hour from here is a great ceramic supply store and they ship all over. It's called Sheffield Pottery. Got it. And we have a couple more questions in the chat, but I just do want to call your attention to if you scroll all the way up in the chat, I had dropped in um, Paula's website, the Berkshire Pottery Tour website, and then two other references um, that Paula mentioned in her talk. Oh yeah, let me just quickly mention that. So Missoni Art Gallery is the gallery that had the um, show and she just has a beautiful gallery. And I thought since she was the um, sort of catalyst for me to go in this direction, I would put her website there. And then Honoring the Future um, is um, an organization that uh, sponsored the award I got at Smithsonian for sustainability. And their whole mission is to uh, educate the public through artwork about climate change. Awesome, those are gonna be so great to check out. Yeah. Um, from Maya. Your pods and vessels seem to be one of a kind, very unique. Do you ever have people asking for a particular pod they may have seen before? And if so, do you reproduce a shape you have made in the past? 
Yeah, that's a really great question because I do get approached a lot. People will see, I've never had a web shop. I've never done anything online until I've had to now. Um, and, I, and so I've never had worked for sale online. Um, and people would look at my website and say, could they buy this piece? But it was usually already sold. And so I do commission work. And if, you, if someone sees a piece that they really love, I will do my best to recreate the form and the surface and the firing. But because every piece obviously is made with my hands and every firing has its own quirks to it, um, it they're never exactly the same. Um, but, but I absolutely will recreate. It's, uh, it's challenging, um, but I'm always up for that. Great. Um, and from Kelly, is the bottom of your brick pit more brick or can you just lay it on the earth with clay sides? And also, do you ever have a desire to create pieces that are food safe? <laughs> yes. Um, yes, uh, you can do it a brick bottom, which I think I have a brick bottom. You could do it right on the ground. Uh, if there's grass, that'll burn away. Um, you could do it on a metal sheet. Um, it's pretty flexible. You can do it in a garbage can. You know, there are so many um, options there. You could do it in an old Weber grill. Um, as far as um, functional wear, absolutely. I, I actually went into ceramics to get away from my sort of blank canvas staring me in the face when I was in college. And I needed something that had very easily accessible purpose to it. And so I started making functional work and that's what got me into the ceramic studio. Um, I make some functional work. I, um, I make these little slab mugs um, and occasionally we'll do other forms than they, I just use my same mass white clay with a clear glaze on it, keep it super simple and it's more about the texture. Um, and I hope to at some point, I don't know, in this lifetime or another, um, uh, do a line of functional work. Ooh. That's very exciting to hear, Paula. <laughs> Proud owner of your mugs. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and because I teach, I have a whole bunch of um, a whole bunch of uh, demo pieces that are are um, functional. Well, fantastic. We are right at seven o'clock. Thank you all so much for joining this evening. It was great to see so many people out with us tonight um, in this virtual world and, and joining Paula. And Paula, thank you so much for your, your knowledge and time and generosity of sharing everything that, that you do. Oh, you're very welcome. And thank you everyone. Thank for you. Thank you. <laughs> and don't forget to come to the pottery tour. It, it'll be lots of fun.